final item of business is members' business debate on motion 8211 in the name of Rona Mackay on condemns unpaid trial shifts. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Rona Mackay to open the debate for around seven minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to bring this debate on un unpaid work trials to the Chamber today and I thank everyone from across the Chamber who signed the motion. As most of you will know, my colleague at Westminster, Stuart Macdonald MP, is bringing this forward as a Members' Bill. But because it's an issue which affects people from across the UK, he particularly wanted a debate in the Scottish Parliament to reflect the cross-party and cross-border support for this serious issue. Organisations supporting the bill are the Scottish Trade Union Congress, National Union of Students, Better Than Zero, The Daily Record, just to name but a few. The Unpaid Trial works, Work Periods Prohibition Bill 2017-19 had its first reading in July last year. Since then, it's gathered cross-party support at Westminster. The second reading is due to take place on March the 16th this year. It's gathered nearly 100 responses and 56% of people either had or knew someone who'd been offered a trial period. Many respondents referred to the trials as demeaning, soul-destroying, humiliating and desperate. An independent report shows unpaid work trials amount to 1.2 billion in miss missing wages. Presiding officer, let me say at the outset of the debate that unpaid work trials are not work experience for students or pupils, which I think we would all agree is invaluable in helping young people to learn about the working environment and help them in their choice of, of employment. This bill is about complete and total exploitation of people, predominantly young, who are doing a job they should be paid for. This is about employers giving false hope to so many people desperate for a job, desperate to feed their family in a country where bankers get bonuses, directors of failing firms, firms such as Carillion get massive payoffs, unemployed young people get cheated of a fair day's pay. This is the shameless exploitation of people for free labour. And as we know, these shifts are often used to cover staff shortages and save money. However, we should recognise that many responsible employers already do pay their trial shift workers. And of course, that should be applauded. Presiding officer, this is Scotland 2018, not Victorian Britain. Let me give... Yes, of course. Neil Finlay. I think... Um... I've just asked um, that we be careful with language because I don't think it should be applauded, applauded. I think it should be absolutely normal that people get paid for the work that they do. Rona Mackay. That point, actually, <coughs> you're, you're completely, completely right. Um, this is Scotland 2018, not Victorian Britain. So let me give you a few examples of what we're talking about here. Of course, there was the headline case of a young man with Asperger's being dumped by B&M after 15 hours of free work. He was on the work rotor for the following weeks when out of the blue he was told to go. He said, if it was really because I couldn't do that work, then fine. But they should have told me that during the work trial. I was led to believe I had the job. Presiding officer, I find that disgusting and cruel. A chef proprietor of an upmarket restaurant in Edinburgh's new town failed to pay hospitality staff for working interviews, quotes, lasting between two and four hours. Past and present staff members confirmed that the chef was using dozens of unpaid trial shifts per week to cover busy periods and using desperate young workers as a free cleaning service. Well, here's my tip for him. Pay your workers and stop exploiting young people. Then there was the mother of a young man who said, my, my son worked in a well-known bakery for six weeks trial for no wages and no job. He eventually left. Presiding officer, the size of the business doesn't matter when it comes to this exploitation. A leading discount supermarket is one of the worst offenders who admit to having 150 youngsters per store coming in for unpaid work trials across the UK. One girl said, I went to one of these and it's actually slave labour. They use you to get the shop ready for opening time and get annoyed if you make any mistakes, even though you haven't been trained to do the job. Rachel, from my own constituency in Bears Den, told me, I did two unpaid trials of five to six hours each for a local restaurant who then strung me along for weeks with the promise of shifts before ending contact. Presiding officer, it has to be said that the hospitality industry is a terrible offender. 
I'm grateful to my friend at Unite Scotland, Brian Simpson, who worked in the trade himself, for supplying me with some shocking statistics of some of the work practices in that industry and for informing me of the excellent campaigns being run by Unite, such as I'm Not on the Menu, which particularly addresses sexual harassment rife within the industry. Unite Scotland have also launched the Fair Hospitality Campaign with a charter which codifies the reforms required to transform the hospitality sector for the benefit of the workers within it. As well as getting rid of unpaid trial shifts, these reforms include the implementation of the real living wage, rest breaks, 100% tips to staff, paid transport past 12 a.m., an end to discriminatory youth rates and, crucially, trade union recognition. Presiding officer, unpaid work trials are in an outrage and can never be justified. So what can we as MSPs in this place do about it? Well, we can make sure the MSP and our constituencies vote for the bill, stop it being talked out in Parliament and turn up to vote for it at Westminster. Members of the public who may be watching this or listening can write to their MP uh, and ask them to support Stuart Macdonald's bill and contact Stuart at Westminster to lend their support to his bill. Above all, we must get the message out that working for nothing in 2018 is simply not acceptable. I ask those employers who think nothing of asking young people to do this to stop and ask themselves, would I want my son or daughter to be treated like that? If it's not good enough for them, it's not good enough for anyone else. Presenting officer, although there's much more to be said, I'll finish now because I'm keen to hear the contributions from across the chamber. Thank you. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. And I call Dean Lockhart to be followed by Claire Hawkey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by uh, thanking Rona Mackay for bringing this important debate to the chamber this afternoon. In Scotland and across the UK, we quite rightly pride ourselves on the ease with which we can set up and run a business. It's easier to set up, run and operate a business in the UK than anywhere else in Europe. Partly as a result of this, employment across the UK is at record highs and unemployment is at record lows. High levels of employment is obviously good news for workers. However, and this is what we're debating uh, this evening, what is not so good, what we need to address and what this debate is looking at is the practice of having someone work for a prolonged period of time without receiving any pay on the basis of a so-called unpaid trial shift. For someone to work for a pro prolonged period without pay on the basis of a, an unpaid trial shift is simply not fair, and Rona Mackay gave a number of good examples. Let me just finish this point, and I'll be happy to take an intervention. Um, the extent of the problems associated with unpaid trial shifts have been highlighted in the Trust for London report, Unpaid Britain. And before I go into the details of that report, I'll uh, give way. Claire Hawkey. I thank the member for taking this intervention. The member mentioned on a couple of occasions there about prolonged work unpaid trials. Would you agree with me that actually to work for any time should be paid? Dean Lockhart. I think to work in an employment situation for any period, absolutely. I think there may be, and I'll come on to this later, there may be circumstances where a very brief trial period, uh, whatever, however long that might be, to assess the skills and suitability of a candidate for a job might be appropriate in some circumstances. But that is not the same in any respect in the uh, unacceptable examples which were highlighted by Rona Mackay. And part of the reason for a... The, the, the fact that these are unacceptable were highlighted in the Trust for London report. Uh, we've already heard that a total of 1.2 billion in wages each year are lost and 1.5 billion of holiday pay is lost as a result of this practice. Uh, this practice has also impacted 23,000 workers uh, in their cash flows and not receiving uh, a salary, uh, which has resulted in a number of people not being able to uh, buy food at a time when they need it. So, Deputy Presiding Officer, this is clearly unacceptable. Employers should adequately pay their staff. Uh, unpaid trial shifts should not be used to cover for inadequate workforce planning or as a way to secure labour on the cheap. In order to address this issue, one of the main challenges we have is the law in this area is unclear. Work trials per se are technically not illegal in the UK. ACAS has said that the law isn't clear on how long a trial has to be before it becomes work and therefore has to be paid. Having further clarity, and I think this would be when we see the detail of the, the bill, this, I would hope, would be one of the objectives 
to provide further clarity around when a limited trial shift may or may not be appropriate. I will in a second. Uh, further clarity on the law in this situation would be very helpful because not just for employees, but for legitimate employers who might, for a very brief period, want to assess the skills of a candidate applying for a job. I'll give way. Rona Mackay. For giving way. Um, would uh, you not agree that it's the moral obligation of an employer to pay their workers for no matter how long they're doing it, um, re regardless of the law? It, it should be their, it's their moral obligation to pay their workers. Would you agree? Dean Lockhart. I agree. If someone is in a work employment position, they've got to be paid, and that's the law. What we're talking about here are circumstances where it may be appropriate to have a trial of the uh, candidate's Members uh, suitability just for, for that job. So let me uh, get straight to the point here. Uh, there may be examples of where a brief unpaid trial period could be legitimate, but only in very limited circumstances. And one of the key questions this uh, bill will face is how to deal with this, how prescriptive or detailed any regulation should be in relation to whether trial shifts could be appropriate in some circumstances. Other countries, for example, Australia, have introduced a principles-based approach to this, and they have set out a number of principles that have to be adhered to if a trial period is to be recognised as being legal. So that perhaps is one avenue this uh, bill may pursue. So Deputy Presiding Officer, let me conclude. Whatever guidelines or regulations are proposed in this area, there is consensus around the general principle. Workers should not be asked to work for any prolonged period without pay. Workers should be paid for any period beyond that is reasonably required to demonstrate their skills for the job. If an employer wants to further assess a candidate's suit suitability after a trial period, they should employ the person as a casual employee for a probationary period and pay them as required under law. In conclusion, no, I you have already concluded. Like I think, to Mr. Lockhart, Mr. Mackay, for bringing this motion to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, call Claire Hawkey to be followed by Johan Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I remind colleagues of my entry in the Register of Members' Interests as a member of Unison. And I congratulate Rona Mackay on securing this important debate. And I too would like to pay tribute to my colleague uh, MP for Glasgow South, Stuart MacDonald, for his terrific work in his campaign to scrap unpaid trial shifts. Presiding Officer, as a committed trade unionist, I have passionately fought against discrimination and unfair work practices throughout the whole of my professional life. I was proud to be a divisional convener in my workplace for Unison, the trade union I'm still a member of today. And as an MSP, I've continued to be an advocate for the rights of workers, using my first speech to criticise the pernicious Tory Trade Union Act and having the privilege to chair the SNP Holyrood Trade Union Group. It comes as a real source of frustration that when we are made aware of issues like those, the use of unpaid trial shifts, that we cannot legislatively do anything here in our parliament due to employment law still being reserved to Westminster. The blocking of these powers by opposition parties during the Smith Commission has proven to be a significant miscalculation. However, that's an argument for another day. Stuart Macdonald's private members' bills has the backing of MPs from all parties and it's absolutely vital that they turn up in their numbers and vote for its progression on the 16th of March. Presiding officer, most people do not object to trial periods being offered by employers as they are, of course, a legitimate way to assess a candidate's skills and suitability. But it's at this point that I have to disagree with Dean Lockhart that any work trial should be paid. And I would like to know from Mr Lockhart how long he would continue in a work trial before he would expect to be paid. Would he like to advise the Chamber? No. Similarly, they give an individual an opportunity to assess if a workplace suits them. However, what is objectionable is the fact that this occurs unpaid. Most of us will be aware of the example of the tea firm Mubu, who were found to be asking trainees to work for a full 40 hours for free. A full week's work, yet not a single penny in pay. Rightly, there was widespread condemnation of the company, with a petition signed by more than 40,000 people urging them to drop their policy, which thankfully they agreed to do. Since launching his bill, Stuart Macdonald has also heard from people who suspect that some businesses are even using unpaid trial shifts to plug staffing shortages with no intention of ever offering an applicant the job. 
This cannot be right and it should not be legal. If someone is required to work a trial period before securing a position, no matter whether they are offered the job at the end of it or not, they should be paid for doing so. Monica Lennon. I'm grateful to Claire Hockey for, for giving way. It was just on the point of, I, mean, I fully support um, Stuart McDonald's uh, bill and I wish him every success in, in, in the House of Commons with that. Um, I've had someone in Hamilton who was in Glasgow for an interview, was asked to stay on, ended up for a couple of hours until her dad came in and, and dragged her home and said, you're not working here. Does Claire Hockey agree there's something we could do in terms of um, local authority licensing rules? Because it seems to be in hospitality that is really prevalent and we've got young people going into these hotels and bars and so on. Is there more we can do with the powers that we have to try and address this at a local level? Claire Hockey. Certainly I would support any uh, strengthening of employment laws in Scotland to protect particularly vulnerable young people who can be exploited in such positions. Stuart Macdonald's own research showed that over 55% of people either had or knew someone who had been offered an unpaid work trial. Whilst the study, as referenced by uh, Rona Mackay earlier by Middlesex University, published last year, estimated that £1.2 billion in wages remains unpaid in Britain each year, and unpaid work trials contribute to this figure. Unpaid trial shifts are clearly a prevalent practice. They are demeaning and exploitative and legislation is therefore required to offer people better protection in the workplace. Presiding officer, it's disappointing that no Conservative MSP has yet signed Rona Mackay's motion, which is surprising considering Theresa May insists they are the party of workers. So today I urge them to lobby Ms. their Hawkins counterparts at Westminster to support the bill. With Brexit on the horizon, many of our workers' rights could soon be eroded. So it's refreshing to see a bill introduced that would extend our protections and not cut them. During my first speech in this parliament, I said that fairness means access to fair work for fair pay. And I fully stand by those remarks. No one should be deprived of a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And that's why I fully support the bill to ban unpaid trial shifts. Joanne Lamont, followed by Ross Greer. Thank you very much, Deputy President Norton. Usually at this point I say that I'm very pleased to be able to participate in this debate. In these circumstances I can say I'm absolutely furious that we have to have this debate at all. I, I want to congratulate Rona Mackay um, both on securing the debate and her speech and also want to congratulate Stuart Macdonald MP on taking this, forward, this proposal forward and his rigour in taking it forward and trying to build cross-party consensus has been admirable. And I know that our own Martin Whitfield MP, Labour MP in East Lothian, has been a co-sponsor of the bill. But I say I'm furious because, I mean, I hear what has been said about this is a complicated area of law. It feels to me that it's morally unacceptable. You don't need legislation at one level to tell you that it's unacceptable to bring people in, give them work to do, and then not pay them at the end of it. But the fact of the matter is that something being morally unacceptable is clearly insufficient. So I would all power to Stuart Macdonald's elbow in making sure that the law is clarified in this regard. It is an important issue and it's an important opportunity to shine light on something that should be seen as utterly unacceptable, but sadly for too many young people is seen as just the way it is. And I would also say that there is legislation already, already existing, which is routinely ignored particularly in the hospitality industry, where we have access to tips, access to proper pay and so on. So we know that legislation is not enough, but it's a good starting point in this regard. We know that young people are disproportionately affected by this idea of trial shifts, but in fact is a reflection of the, um, the fact that precarious work is endemic. And this is yet another element of an increased workplace practice that is systematically and unashamedly exploitative of the people who seek work from them. We only need to look at what happens to people who are sent by the job centre to uh, various companies, and they have what's known as a revolving door. They know they're not going to last more, of a, more than a fortnight, but their business proposal is based on just securing labour that comes through um, without expecting to stay. Unite and Better uh, Than Zero have spoken about this practice and the cynicism of offering shifts with no intention whatsoever of giving somebody a job, or indeed, even if they are planning to give them a job, see how many shifts they can get out of them first. Must appall us all. 
we have to respond to testimony of those young people that we, um, we got in briefings and many other young people whose voices are not heard in this regard, who routinely uh, have their expectations um, treated in this way. And it demands a response from this parliament as well as Westminster. And of course, as in all of this, in this area of precari precarious work, we're told it is about choice. But we all know that take it or leave it is no choice at all. And too often, young people are faced with either accept whatever conditions are placed in your work, whether it's trial shifts, whether it's um, not being guaranteed any work at all, um, they're told, well, that's a matter of choice. And we need to be careful. We don't elevate some of these work practices to an idea of choice. I don't accept there may be one person in 100,000 who supports a zero hours contract as it's currently deployed as a matter of choice because all the choice is on the one side. We should reflect that this is about the utter imbalance of power in the workplace, that good employers have resisted that and should be rewarded for that good practice and we should be denouncing exploitation. It's important that we recognise that there are employers who don't behave this way. And we should also understand that the economy of this country cannot be predicated on these very poor practices. Untrained staff doing a job um, in circumstances where they get no reward, no encouragement for trying hard despite their best endeavours. We want an economy that is fairer than that. And so I very much support the legislative proposals. But I would also say that we need to look at what we can do here right now. Exploitation should not be rewarded. No business should be given money by government or support by Scottish Enterprise or other enterprise agencies. They shouldn't access the small business uh, you come to proposal close, please, if Ms. they're Lennon. in circumstances where they do this. And ultimately, as I've said before, we should not be defining as a positive destination any work which exploits the young people who go and access that work. We know that we can do Could both you come of these to things. Close, please, we Ms. can Lennon. support the legislation, but I would ask the Minister, in summing up, to confirm that he'll be willing to look at how he can use his power not to reward bad practice, but take the opportunity to eradicate it. Can I remind members that there can only be one conclusion to a contribution? And uh, I did ask for speeches of up to four minutes, please, and I've been generous in relation to where people have had taken interventions. Uh, time is running short. Can I have Ross Greer plus Tom Arthur, please? Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like colleagues, I'm very grateful to Rona Mackay for giving us the opportunity to debate this issue in Parliament today. There have been some really exciting developments in Scotland in recent years. Campaigns like Living Rent Against uh, Dodgy Landlords and the Better Than Zero campaign led by young people being exploited by an economy designed to take from them and to give to those who already have more than what they need. These campaigns, particularly Better Than Zero, have shown the power that young, exploited workers have when they come together, not just in individual workplaces, but as a movement to fight for their rights. Better Than Zero has had some huge wins, such as over the notorious employer, the G1 Group, only achieved after a campaign that included direct action, lobbying and negotiation. That campaign secured an end to staff paying for their own uniforms, having spillages and breakages docked from their wages, and an end to Zero Hours contracts. Now, of course, the G1 group tried to roll back from the promises that they made, but they know that young workers are ready to shut them down again if needed. That is exactly the kind of mass movement of workers that we need in an era of economic exploitation. But, of course, that's only treating the symptoms, not the cause. It's the responsible of parliamentarians to treat the cause of this. Better Than Zero shouldn't have to fight so hard for basic justice for workers. The reason that they do is the UK has the worst, the weakest employment laws in Western Europe. Unpaid trial shifts are not clearly addressed in UK law at present. And it's not enough to say that the law mandates employers to pay staff once a trial becomes actual work. Because as Dean Walker did fairly highlight, there is no black and white separation of the two. There is no clear definition when it moves from being a trial to being work. And bad bosses love grey areas of the law where they can exploit often struggling and desperate people to maximise their own profits. That's exactly what Stuart McDonald's proposed bill would hopefully, hopefully bring to an end. And that's why it's backed by the Better Than Zero campaign and by the STUC. We know the link between low pay and no pay, the link between low paid work and poverty. Those in low pay are often more likely to be in unreliable work and temporary work. So they're far more likely to often be out of work entirely, 
unable to pay rent, put food on the table, to cover heating bills. We are all, as MSPs, very familiar with this situation. It fills our inboxes and appears at our surgeries every week. In this position, someone is far less able to say no to unpaid trial work that has the potential for paid work at the end of it. And as organisations like the Joseph Rowntree Foundation have repeatedly shown, this makes it near impossible to break out of a cycle of low pay and no pay. All someone's energy is spent looking for work and struggling to get by while out of work or in unpaid work. This puts all the power in the hands of exploitative employers. And it shows up the red herring of this being a matter of workers' choice. What choice do you have when you're struggling to stave off eviction because you can't cover your rent, you're struggling to feed yourself or your family, and the potential for paid work is dangled in front of you? The UK's welfare system, of course, only makes this even worse, as MSPs were well aware of the disaster that is universal credit. It takes over a month from making a claim before payment is given, and making that claim requires a lengthy application process and significant amounts of evidence. Many people simply cannot afford to wait so long, so take the risk of unpaid work in the hope that it will become paid work quickly. But we've heard many instances of unpaid work that, of course, does not result in paid work. Examples have already been given by other members, including by Ron Mackay, the infamous case of the young man at B&M who was dangled along for a significant amount of time before being told to go home. So people are left even further away from a pay paycheck, any money at all than they otherwise would have been, and closer to or deeper into poverty. And let's be clear, this is all about maximising profits for the employer. Work creates wealth, and the expectation that the worker who creates that wealth shares in it should be the norm. But that doesn't happen in the cycle of unpaid trial shifts. Whether you rest at my end of the political spectrum or Dean Lockhart's, surely you should understand that that is wrong. And I hope that MPs across the west of Scotland will support Stuart Macdonald's bill and the MSPs across the country contact Better Than Zero to see if you can help combat bad bosses in your area. Workers are the real wealth creators in our society. And in the UK of the 21st century, they deserve to know that they will receive fair pay for fair work. Uh, I still have uh, four open debate speakers uh, wishing to take part, um, so I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes, but by nowhere near that. <laughs> I give due warning. I, may I invite Rona Mackay to move the motion? Move the motion. The question is that under Rule 8.14.3 the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we agreed? We are agreed and the debate is therefore extended. And I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Thank you, President Officer, and I promise I won't take any more in four minutes. Uh, <laughs> rare for me. I'd like to begin by thanking my colleague, Ronan Mackay, for bringing this uh, very important motion to the Chamber and also to uh, pay tribute and thanks to my SNP party colleague, um, Stuart MacDonald, for his uh, vigorous pursuit of this issue and for introducing these members bill. I think it's a uh, um, a bill that all MPs in Scotland, indeed across the UK, should get behind. And as Ross Greer rightly highlighted, regardless of where you are on the uh, political spectrum. Um, I should at this point, before I proceed, I declare um, uh, an interest as a member of the Musicians' Union and as a, as a former musician. Um, a former, I don't know if you ever can be a former musician, but um, because where um, music leads, the rest of the economy uh, tends to follow. I don't think there's um, any working musician has ever, um, is, is not familiar with being asked to work for free. Um, and indeed, it's often seen as um, the, the only path to success is often seen through working uh, for no pay. Indeed, the uh, Musicians' Union in 2015, um, and survey of their members, 60% of their members, that's 30,000 members, had reported that they had worked for free. Um, interestingly, there was research in 2016 uh, by the Association of Independent Professionals and the Self-Employed and the Freelancer Club uh, and it suggested that 20% um, of respondents actually identified working for free as a standard practice in the industry. Um, and the reason that I highlight this is because it has become the cultural norm. It has become culturally accepted if a young musician of a young band starting off um, are subject to uh, an unscrupulous uh, promoter or agent who encourages them to go and work um, in certain, perform in certain venues, do take on certain gigs, with a promise of more work down the line, we're likely to accept. But very often it can be the case that the work doesn't materialise or the promised rates um, don't materialise. And this is something that uh, musicians have been familiar with um, for quite some time. And I um, want to sort of pay tribute to the Musicians' Union for their Work Not Play campaign, which has been highlighting this issue for some time. Um, I think 
there was probably another couple of points that I wish to actually highlight before moving on from the uh, survey I just mentioned, the uh, independent uh, professionals and self-employed survey and the freelancer club, because I think there's some interesting data on those people who are working unpaid. It suggests that a majority of the respondents to the survey, 44%, fit into the 16 to 29 age bracket. Um, and shockingly as well though, many of those freelancers had up to seven years experience in their trade. So it's not just young and experienced people, it's people who actually have real skills and real experience in the area are still working and not being paid. Um, and this is very telling. A large, quite significant proportion, 67% were women. Um, and so I, th I think when we actually look at the groups who are being affected, we know the challenges we face with creating a more equal economy with addressing the gender pay gap. And, us, and given that we are celebrating young people this year, there's no more appropriate year to be seeking to um, end uh, trial shifts. So one of the points I would make to Dean Lockhart, who suggested that perhaps for a limited period, um, unpaid trial shifts may have merit. I say this is how it started to an extent in music, and you then develop a culture which becomes expanded and it becomes the norm where you end up with 20% of people working, certainly. Quickly, Dean Lockhart. A very quick question. Would the members suggest that we ban all trial shifts on that basis? Tom Arthur. I, th I think there's, there's, uh, what there's an option for is a probationary period. And I think that's perfectly legitimate. People can be, have a probationary period where they are paid a wage as anyone else would be. And at the end of that probationary period, if they don't, they don't meet the requisite requirements, then action can be taken. So I think these laws already exist. I think people who work should be paid. But just the final point I would want to make is this speaks to the broader fair work agenda. And one of the other terms that's been kind of imported from the world of music into the general economy is that of the gig economy, which is just a fancy way of saying um, insecure work, low paid work, precarious work. Um, I, I think you know, with the challenges that we, we face going forward, um, as an economy with the rise of automation, the hollowing out of middle income jobs and middle skilled jobs, is that now is a time to actually be strengthening workers' rights because if we don't do it, we're going to face a future where more and more people um, are going to be uh, in, in a position that far too many musicians have found themselves in, which is that of insecure work and all the stress that comes with that. Thank you. So much for promises, Mr Arthur. <laughs> I call Jamie Halcrow Johnson to be followed by Ruth McGuire. I'm not going to make that promise on, on that basis. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'd like to congratulate uh, Rona Mackay for securing this debate today and also highlighting some of the, case, highlighting some of the cases that um, she did. Uh, and I would also extend my congratulations to Stuart MacDonald uh, for bringing forward a private member's bill in the UK Parliament on this important issue. We've already seen a level of public debate uh, around unpaid work trials and some examples coming to light. Many of the instances we have heard of where it seems trial shifts are being abused are in retail and hospitality industries, sectors represented disproportionately in tourism-focused economies like in uh, those in my part, uh, the, the region that I represent. It's often, uh, often a feature, a hidden feature of the economy too, uh, as Mr. McDonald mentioned, we're often dealing with low paid workers, people coming out of spells of unemployment and industries where trade union membership is not commonplace. As a consequence, where we see abuse of work trials, it is, com uh, it is most commonly perpetrated against the very people that often found at the sharp end of sharp practices in employment relations. It seems barely conceivable that it can take a month to assess someone's su suitability for a job. It is true that many employers are moving away from yeah, I will do. Neil Finlay. I, I maybe you went too fast on me there, but he seemed to be suggesting that he supported um, people organising in trade unions. Uh, I wonder if he could um, advise why his party brought in the um, trade union building. Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Um, I think we're changing the subject slightly here, but as a former general secretary of a trade union, I recognise I recognise the role they can play, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in every case that the trade unions are right. Um, as a consequence, where we see the abuse of work trials, it is most commonly perpetrated against the very people. Oh, sorry, uh, it seems barely conceivable that it can take a month to assess someone's suitability for a job. It is true that many employers are moving away from the traditional 45-minute sit-down interview, with a rise of day-long assessment centres, practice t uh, tasks, and more probing questioning now being seen as giving a better reflection of an applicant's behaviours and abilities. However, in the case of unpaid work trials, the applicant, if we can call someone who's effectively working a job for several weeks as an applicant, is not just experiencing a rigorous interview, they are undertaking the duties of an employee in a workplace. And the cost can be considerable. 
Not only is a person deprived of an income for the work that they are undertaking, but there's also potential loss of the opportunities that may have been uh, otherwise taken up over that period. Throughout that time, the possibility of a job is dangled continually in front of a person, perhaps more than one, competing for the same position. At the end, it may well be that the prospective employee has found him or herself still unemployed. And it's tempting to say that the applicant is then landed back where he or she started. But that's not the truth. In reality, they have been set back. The law rightly limits attempts to restrict and bind people's labour when businesses step beyond a level seen as legitimate. Restricted covenants, for example, must be, uh, must be proportionate to be enforceable, as the courts recognise not only an individual's interest, but a public interest is not standing in the way of people taking on work. Through that same lens, we can see the problem with individuals effectively taken off the job market for a month, but with no promise of any work. Some, employees, some sorry, employers have pointed out that employees have resources ex expended on them during trial shifts, staff time, induction, and so on, which they suggest make these shifts not particularly productive in a business sense. This, however, seems to miss the point. Even when an applicant is successful, the employer has offset the cost of the normal induction training that is part of any job. That, too, is a clear disadvantage. So Mr. McDonald's focus on this area is commendable. There are certainly some details that require to be clarified in his proposed legislation, several, several of, which, which, of which he himself has highlighted. One is how earnings from a work trial will interact with out-of-work and other income-related benefits, and significantly where these need to, uh, need to reapply if unsuccessful. Another will be whether some flexibility may be found. Instinctively, it is quite different to place an applicant in a workplace for a few hours as opposed to a few weeks. And as I touched on earlier, there is already a move amongst recruiters towards a sort of assessment process that can take the best part of a day. In any case, I'm sure I will be joining members uh, from across the chamber in keeping a close eye on the progress of this proposed bill, and I look forward to being it debated. I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer, um, and I thank my colleague Rona Mackay for bringing this important topic to the Chamber. Thanks are also due to Stuart Macdonald MP for his work in building cross-party consensus on this issue at Westminster, and I'll take this opportunity to reiterate my full support for his private members' bill to ban unpaid trial shifts. It's maybe particularly appropriate that this debate is taking place during the year of young people, because as the motion points out, it's our young people who are most likely to be exploited in this way. At the very beginning of their working life, young people who are ready and willing to work are being treated with contempt and disrespect and left disillusioned and disappointed about the world of employment. This exploitation is indefensible. It takes advantage of young people's desire and need for employment to manipulate them into working for free. Working for no reward is the very definition of slave labour and it should have no place in a modern Scotland. We will all have heard stories of the exploitation happening and, and these unpaid trial shifts and I thank Unite and the STUC for their briefings in advance of today's debate, which include case studies of young people being exploited through unpaid trial shifts. One girl describes doing two unpaid trial shifts in a restaurant of five to six hours each, no job at the end of it, no remuneration. Another tells of how a young man did an unpaid trial shift in a local restaurant. As well as not being paid for his time, he was just left behind the bar with no direction and the manager didn't even speak to him. My own daughter once undertook a trial shift at a bar only to be told afterwards that they were looking for someone with bad experience, something she'd pointed out that she didn't have in her application. None of these ex examples are acceptable and they have to change. Trialing people before hiring them is completely legitimate. That's what probation periods are for. But it has to be done fairly and respectfully. And at the very, very least, this means that young people must be paid for their time, whether they get offered a job at the end of the trial or not. But more than that, it should mean treating them fairly and with respect throughout their trial. They should be given proper training and induction before being set to work. They should have frequent breaks in accordance with the law. The employer needs to ensure that they're properly fed and watered, and if they're working late hours, that they get home safely. None of these things are radical, presiding officer, and they don't place a great burden on a healthy business. It's simply about treating young people with common decency and basic fairness, something that I'm sure no one in the chamber would disagree with. 
The good news is that we can all play a part in changing things. As consumers, we've got a lot of power. We can put pressure on businesses by refusing to give our custom to those that exploit young people. Yes. Johan Lamont. I absolutely agree with you that I think we need to know where these bad practices are and vote with our own feet. But would you agree with me that there are things the Scottish Government could also do as someone, as a, a, an organisation with money that could use its authority to insist these practices don't continue? Ruth McGuire. I think that we all, that every, um, everyone should do everything they can. So absolutely, I think that, that unfortunately money talks, so we need to spend a little wisely, whether we're individuals or organisations. Um, as consumers, we can put pressure on businesses by refusing to give our custom to those who exploit young people through unpaid trial shifts and poor working conditions. And those of us in a position to do so can expose these businesses and make sure as many people as possible know what's going on behind closed doors. We can also encourage the young people in our lives to join a trade union. And as MSPs, we can work with local councillors to embed the Fair Hospitality Charter within the required business practices of local licensing authorities. As is the case when it comes to discussing the living wage or supporting flexible working, treating workers with fairness and respect isn't just about being morally right. It's also good for business because workers who feel valued and supported will be more productive and more committed to their workplace. Banning unpaid trial shifts is absolutely the right thing to do, and I fully support this motion. The last of the open debate contributions is Neil Finlay. Thanks, President Officer, and I thank Rona Mackay for bringing up what is a very important debate to the Chamber. Can I declare my membership of Unite the Union? Um, the reality is that employment in uh, Scotland and across the UK is one in which far too many people and their families are struggling on low pay jo and job insecurity with repeated attacks on their rights. I uh, recently carried out a survey of uh, hospitality and uh, food workers in my uh, area and poverty pay uh, failure to consult over shift changes, zero hours contracts, companies taking tips, staff having to find their own way home uh, uh, work after working late are just some of the ways that workers are being exploited and put in danger. And uh, some of these, the comments I received back from uh, uh, people, were, uh, people who were employed in a wide variety of workplaces, from uh, Glen Eagles Hotel to Weatherspoons to Sports Direct, Ryman, Starbucks, Tesco, and many, and many others. Um, but it's the prevalence and normalisation of the use of unpaid trial shifts that I think is one of the most pernicious ways in which workers are being exploited, often by some of the biggest and most profitable businesses on the high street. Uh, the number of companies using these shifts has grown mass massively. 25% of the people who responded to my survey had been asked to do an unpaid trial shift, and 52% were on a zero hours uh, contract. People have mentioned the case of Craig Robertson, that uh, young man's Auntie contacted me, she's one of my constituents, about his situation. And, uh, and people have said that he had to do um, three separate five-hour shifts at B&M in Wishaw. Uh, B&M uh, refused uh, even to write back to me when I wrote to them asking what had happened. And if they are willing to exploit a young man with Asperger's, it makes you wonder what else they are willing to do in order to maximise their profit. It is absolutely despicable. Uh, I have one employer who has offered, uh, who, who has potentially an offer of employment for him later in the year, but if there are any employers um, who are listening to this debate, if they can offer Craig a job, please get in touch. All he wants to do is a chance to work. Uh, over the last while, I've been working with um, members of my own party, we Unite the Union, and uh, um, Brian Simpson and others from Better Than Zero to target Livingston Shopping Centre. Uh, promoting Unite's Fair Hospitality Charter. Livingston is the fast food capital of Scotland with hundreds of school pupils and students working for some of the biggest and most profitable companies uh, in the food and hospitality sector. Uh, what type of introduction to the world of work is it when you have to do an unpaid trial shift half a week or an, uh, indeed an unpaid trial week? And many of these young people, when they do get a job, struggle to get by on, uh, I think it's around £4, is it £4.20? Uh, yeah, £4.20 an hour for a 16-year-old. Uh, that's the minimum wage. For some, the bus fare is more than an hour or two's wages. At New Year, the company that runs Edinburgh's Hugman A celebration, Underbelly, sought to employ 300 volunteers, volunteers to work night shift for free 
and one of the busiest, coldest and most profitable nights of the year at the New Year celebrations. This was presented as a great development opportunity for volunteers. What utter garbage. It was plain and simple exploitation to maximise their profits. But working with Better Than Zero, Unite and the STEC, we embarrassed the company into a U-turn on many of these jobs. This was a publicly funded event. It got public money. It should never happen when we are financing events like that. So I applaud Stuart McDonald's bill and I support him in taking that forward. A fair day's work de deserves a fair day's pay. If we allow these young people to be exploited, then they'll come for the rest of the workforce and indeed they already have in many sectors. Finally, can I say to Mr Lockhart, I can just see him in the 19th century saying to the young boy, five-year-old, listen wee man, get up that chimney. If you're any good at it, we'll pay you in a couple of weeks' time. Dean Lockhart. Uh, just to clarify with the member, we agree with the general principles of this yeah. bill. Um, I, maybe he has the details. Stage one comprised three lines of text. Does Mr Finlay have more details about the actual content of the bill? If you would close now, please, Mr Finlay. Sorry, it finished. <laughs> Could you stand up and say that? Just Sorry. keep everything right. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have any more uh, details of the bill, but what Mr uh, Lockhart has said simply is that he is uh, willing to allow exploitation to continue. That's what he's saying. That's what you're saying. Because you're, you're saying that you would be willing, you're saying that you'd be willing to continue with people not being paid for being employed. To me, that's exploitation. To you, it might not be. I think we close now. <laughs> and I call Jamie Hatburn. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Gray. Point of order, Ross Gray. I do apologise. I'm very conscious that other members have been declaring an interest with their trade union membership, and I did not do so. So just to very briefly declare that I'm a member of the National Union of Journalists. It's not really a point of order, but I'll let you away with that one for clarity. And I call Jamie Hepburn to respond to this debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Well, I have to say, President Officer, you've been remarkably and uncharacteristically generous this evening. So I'm going to make no promises whatsoever about sticking to my time. I'm sure you wouldn't have expected me to do so. Can I uh, join others in welcoming uh, this debate uh, that we've had this evening. Uh, I think uh, it's been an, an important one. It's an issue that we should uh, be debating in this uh, chamber. So can I thank Rory Mackay for uh, having uh, brought it forward uh, this evening. Uh, can I also say I uh, fully support Stuart McDonald's, uh, uh, Stuart McDonald MP's uh, private member's bill on unpaid trial work uh, periods. It's very uh, much in alignment with the Scottish Government's fair work uh, agenda. He should be congratulated for uh, taking it forward. Uh, Rona Mackay, Ross Greer, and others mentioned the Better Than Zero campaign uh, being led by young members of Unite. I know they've been uh, crucial uh, in terms of informing uh, Stuart McDonald's uh, bill, uh, and I congratulate them for the, the activities that they are taking forward. Of course, Better Than Zero uh, campaign uh, is one that we are supporting through the Trade Union Modernisation Fund, and I uh, wish them well in all their uh, endeavours. Uh, I, I don't believe that any uh, person should be put in the a position of having to make the choice of working for free uh, in fear of the risk of not working uh, at all. Uh, unpaid work trials are, are thought to be most prevalent in uh, the retail and hospitality sectors with the young people and migrants most uh, affected. Uh, whilst it's uh, uh, clearly, uh, which is why of course it's welcome that the Better Than Zero uh, campaign, uh, Fair Hospitality uh, campaign uh, has been uh, put in place uh, focusing on the hospitality sector. Uh, whilst it's difficult to quantify the number of, of cases of unpaid uh, work trials, it's very clear from what we have heard this evening that they are, uh, it's out there and uh, it is a very real uh, practice. And I thought Tom Arthur and even Neil Finlay were uh, very uh, correct to caution against the danger that such practice uh, becomes uh, normalised. So it is important that we uh, focus on this issue. And it's particularly important, I believe, that the state acts responsibly in uh, this regard. On that basis, um, we should focus on the Department of Work and Pensions voluntary unpaid work tri uh, trial uh, programme. This is a, an initiative uh, that is actively promoted by Job Centre Plus uh, through uh, its website to promote uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, idea of unpaid uh, work uh, trials in uh, the business environment. And there are aspects of that that are particularly concerning to me, uh, not least the language that is utilised with by the Department of Work and Pensions uh, on their website. They talk about the benefits of 
uh, the work trial, they, they extol the virtues actually more to the employer than they do to the potential employee, uh, which in the first instance is of particular concern uh, to me because clearly the job centre plus should be about getting a person into uh, fulfilling and meaningful work. But the language they use about promoting the benefits of uh, this uh, programme to employers along the lines of being it's risk free. You can try the person out before making a final uh, decision is uh, not only uh, for me uh, somewhat demeaning uh, and disrespectful to that uh, potential uh, employee. It strikes me as uh, very little serious uh, commitment to uh, the long term employment prospects of any individual uh, taking uh, part in such uh, uh, an initiative. Uh, and in that regard, uh, President Officer, I uh, wrote to uh, the former Secretary of State for uh, Work and Pensions, David Gott, back in, in November, to not only set out the government's support for Stuart Macdonald's uh, members, uh, private members' uh, bill, uh, but also to raise the concerns we have about uh, the manner in which uh, Job Centre Plus is promoting uh, this uh, programme. Uh, and in my uh, letter, I was uh, very clear that whilst I understand that the expectation is, and I won't get too drawn into how this could be done on a practical basis, because I think we've heard very clear concerns about how it could be done on a practical basis. But whilst employers are expected to run work trials in a positive way, it, with the expectation they will offer the job unless the participant proves not to be suitable, it, I then went on to ask I'd be grateful to receive statistics regarding the number of work trials that have led to permanent employment and where trials have not resulted in employment, the reasons why. It is of considerable concern to me, President Officer, that thus far I have not had uh, any response. So I look forward to uh, Mr Gock's uh, successor estimate of you providing me with uh, that detailed information. Of course. Joanne Lamont. If you were able to establish the companies who are being exploitative in this way, would you be willing to say, as a Scottish Government, that you wouldn't um, allow them to access the support provided by the Scottish Government in relation to whether it's procurement, whether it's support for apprenticeships or whatever? Jamie Hepburn. Well, uh, of course, what I it was going to go on to set out is a very clear and firm commitment to uh, fair work uh, practice. Now, what I would, first of all, need to do is secure that information and to look and uh, analyse and assess what uh, that means uh, in practical terms. Thus far, I've not been furnished uh, with that information. Uh, my uh, perspective is that ultimately, and this is what we're debating uh, this evening, of course, is that we require a change to employment law. That's the, the fundamental way in which we can deal uh, with this particular uh, matter. Uh, and that's why we're debating uh, Mr uh, Macdonald. Uh, give me a second, Mr Finlay. Of course, I'll give way to you. Um, that's why we're debating this uh, legislation. I understand uh, the point that um, uh, Joanne Lamont talked about, about it should be a moral imperative for employers not to act in this way. Uh, that's, I, I do agree with that to some extent. That's why uh, the Scottish Government recognised that moral imperative. We don't act in that fashion. But what we've heard uh, this evening is that far too many employers uh, act in a particular fashion that doesn't recognise that moral imperative. So I find it uh, confusing that she's from a sedentary position is disagreeing with that legislation is required. I thought that's why we were having uh, this debate. Now, I recognise there are actions we oh, can take. Excuse, take. excuse me, Minister, um, please. We had a request for an intervention that Mr Hepburn was considering. Can I remind all members that for all this is a members debate and much more informal um, than business during the day, everyone should still speak through the chair and have recognition that the chair is here for a reason. Uh, can you decide, Mr Hepburn, please, which intervention you're taking? I was going to take Mr Finlay's intervention. Just before I do, just to let me finish the point, President Officer, I'm very clear there is more that we can always be willing to consider to do, but fundamentally, I believe it requires a change in the law. Mr Finlay. And Mr Finlay. Putting aside the change in the law and thinking about the powers that we have here, and on a po very much on a point of principle here, would the Minister agree that where we know there are companies that are exploiting young people, whether it be on unpaid trial shifts or in other areas of their employment practices, that the government should not be furnishing them with public money. Jamie Hepburn. Well, well, we've set out a very clear expectation that those we engage with, those uh, businesses, those employers we engage with, should adhere to our fair work uh, agenda. And in that sense, we are uh, promoting that fair work agenda through a variety of means, such as uh, the uh, living wage accreditation scheme, whereby we see 
uh, some over one, uh, nearly one third of uh, accredited businesses, uh, employers, I should say, uh, across the UK. Here uh, in Scotland, the highest uh, proportion of uh, its working age population uh, paid at least a living wage or more uh, is uh, found to be uh, in Scotland. That's why we've got the, the business pledge, which uh, contains so much fair work practice. That's why we're uh, promoting the, the fair work agenda through the Fair Work Convention. That's why we've proposed the Trade Union uh, Act. That's why we have the Trade Union Modernisation Fund. But fundamentally, it comes back to the, uh, the fundamental point that I, I made, uh, that whilst we can take these actions, the fundamental challenge we have before us, and that's why I think uh, most of us, at least, that have taken part in this debate, are supporting Stuart MacDonald's uh, bill before uh, the uh, House of Commons, is that we need and require a change in the law I wish that it would were that this parliament could change the law. We can't, so that's why we should be getting behind Stuart MacDonald, getting behind Stuart MacDonald MP's bill, and let's make sure that we see Westminster pass that legislation. Point of order, Neil Finlay. You know, so I, 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 the, the minister may have inadvertently misled the chamber, but I think he said that a third of businesses had signed up to the living, living wage. Um, there's 300 and odd thousand businesses in Scotland. I think a thousand have signed up to be living wage employers. So maybe the minister would want to correct that at a future date. Try to be helpful. I, I am happy to let the minister respond to that, to have clarification in this member's debate. Jamie I, I would urge Mr Finlay to check the re, uh, official report. That is not what I said. The point I made, of course, President Officer, is that nearly one third of those accredited businesses across the UK are here in Scotland. Is everyone finished? <laughs> <laughs> that concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.